Whoever could make two ears of corn or two blades of grass to grow upon a spot of ground where only one grew before would deserve better of mankind and do more essential service to his country than the whole race of politicians put together. The King of Brobdignag in Gulliver's Travels. The people who made DDT that caused those problems back in the 40s and ever since were helping to make more ears of corn. Either literally by getting rid of insect pests on crops or more generally by improving the human condition. And what they didn't know was how DDT would build up in the food chain. Making more ears of corn is still an ambition shared by chemists. But today we try to solve such problems more by learning from the natural world and by taking advantage of what other people have learned from it. Look around rural communities in many parts of the world and there'll be people making use of the plants they find around them. The knowledge of which plant has value when it should be harvested and what part should be used has been maintained through tradition over thousands of years, often only by word of mouth. And it's important knowledge. In India, the government has set up an enterprise to make sure that what is known about these plants is never lost. Because these villagers aren't preparing just food or firewood, they're making medicines. And the plant they're working with? The neem tree. The neem tree can be found all over India. And extracts from its bark, seeds and leaves play an important part in providing cures for over 50 ailments from liver disease to leprosy. This may not look like a medicine production line, at least as we know it. But it doesn't mean what's produced doesn't work. Behind these practices of mashing, boiling and distilling, there is a basic scientific rationale. The effects of different plants on the body have been observed on many subjects over hundreds or even thousands of years. These are the results of scientific progress, progress by trial and error. Methods, mixtures and dosages have been adjusted to gain better medical effects. In India, these treatments are used by millions and the neem tree has played a central role in this. And it is this wealth of knowledge that the West wants to tap into. The race is definitely on. In Pune, there is one man who has made the neem his life's work. He has spent 30 years collating information on different products that have been made from the neem. It has been a labor of love. All that he has done has been unfunded, driven by a belief in the value of the tree. I feel that the labor which I have put it for the last 30 years, now it is getting very good response from all over the world. That has created real interest. There is a boom of neem from all over the world. And we, with the letters which I have received from different countries, telephones and people approaching me, then I think the interest is created all over the world. It has a myriad of applications, from toothpaste to face cream. The problem is, do they all work? And which of them do we want to use ourselves? One idea for research emerged from the original uses of the plant back in the village. Grain needs to be stored for up to six months. Fresh neem leaves are mixed in the grain to prevent it from being eaten by insects. Put together with the knowledge that farmers use a neem extract to spray on crops to prevent insect damage, and you've latched onto a real unquestionable biological activity. Not in healthcare, but for agriculture. 
And here it is, a neem tree. Or at least it will be in 20 years' time. The people in India have been growing these things for thousands of years. And they've known for a long time that insects can't stand the taste of neem trees. In fact, some insects can't even bear to walk on them. Now, in the jargon, that makes an extract of this an antifeedant. And the next bit of the story charts the problems involved in getting from that bit of information to a detailed understanding of the chemistry involved in antifeedants. Thank mm-hmm. you.